Okay, well, I've got 11 o'clock on my um, uh, on my device here, so we will officially get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, for those of us who have been to, or those of you who have been to the MyNet education sessions before, um, you'll recognize Christine Nielsen and I, who are your MyNet librarians. And today we have um, two very uh, special guest presenters, Hal Lowen and Meg Miller, who are both librarians from the University of Manitoba. And we are so thrilled for you to come today to um, teach us all things about using data to tell stories. Uh, with that, over to you. Thanks, Orvi. So as Orvi mentioned, I'm Meg and my co-presenter Hal. And today we are going to be talking to you about creating data stories. Great, thanks. So uh, as we usually do, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the University of Manitoba is located on Treaty 1 territory, the original ancestral lands of the Ashinaabe Cree, Ojibwe, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and is the homeland of the Métis Nation. We are also home to the Na uh, National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation, which is the physical and digital archive for all the materials collected by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Their objective is to teach Canadians about the history and legacy of residential school system in Canada. And so we wanted just to take a moment to, ex oh, if you want to take a moment to explore nativeland.ca, which uh, Meg used to generate that map that you see uh, so that you can in visualize the Indigenous territories, languages, and treaties in your area. Thanks, Meg. So we're going to start this with a recent presentation, as I do my air quotes, uh, and what a typical, um, well, maybe not so typical PowerPoint presentation with some data visualization is might look like so you might come to a conference and see this so our research is on forest creatures and activities recreational opportunities for woodland creatures in city parks so the project we give a nice long description of the project so it's right yep yeah, and our participants who we all included what were the uh, our uh included animals and our excluded animals And this is what we found the, the breakout to be, right? So we have mice, squirrels, beavers, raccoons, skunks, and deers. And so we had to measure something. So we decided to measure how they relaxed, what they did, when were they chasing, their running and leaping abilities. And so this is some of the things that we found when we were surveying the several parks in the city and here's our graph representing their activity levels uh, in by month some things you had to know about the squirrels is they're ob obligate uh, hibernators uh, so it's a spontaneous type of hibernation and that was our presentation so you so, probably could see that there are some issues with it. So Meg's going to go on this next little journey with you. So what I'm going to start it by talking about is data visualization and getting creating better information with better graphics. I have two main objectives for you today. The first is to cover basic visualization types. And the next is to cover some best practices in terms of color, cognitive load, and reproducibility. Our scope, uh, data visualization is just a massive, massive um, topic. And so what I'm focusing on is information visualization. So think of that as visualizing your own research data, not scientific visualization, which would be your um, doing MRI scans, um, creating 3D renderings of hearts, stuff like that. So 
what I like to say to people is to step back and ask yourself, what do I need to know? The first thing you need to know is your data. So I have a data guide that if you're familiar with the subject guides at the university, uh, you could find me there. In terms of data visualization, my contact information, and what I like to tell people is the whole purpose of data visualization is that you are making your theme or your topic more easily understandable by your end audience. So creating crazy visualizations like hanging rudograms and things like that, while it's fun, while it's a little bit sexy, um, that might not be super useful for your end user. So what can you do? What I like to do is break things down into four different categories, comparison, composition, distribution, and relationships. And then within those four categories, there are four kind of ideal types of visualizations that you can use. So if you are doing a comparison using column graphs, line graphs, bar charts, or cartographic maps will be useful for you. If you are looking at composition, then using something like a pie chart, a stack bar chart, a tree map, or a cartographic map will be good. What you want to keep in mind is that the human brain is only, isn't great at dealing with a huge number of things at once. So keeping your categories at three to five classes, five to seven at the most, or if it's something else like provinces and territories that we've got more than five and seven, five to seven of those, but people in Canada kind of have an understanding of what that breakdown means, um, then using things that way. If we're looking at distribution, then what we want to use are line graphs, histograms, scatter plots, and different types of cartographic maps. And then finally, relationships. So if you want to visualize a relationship, scatter plot, network diagrams, bubble graphs, different concept models, or cartographic maps are useful. There are many, many different ways to create all of these different visualizations. Um, I link to them in the tools section, and then they are broken out in terms of accessibility, different types of visualizations like charts, graphs, and simple maps. Some of these are proprietary, others are open. If you want to create infographics, do more in-depth GIS analysis, do some graphic design using open tools. Um, or if you're into programming, there are different um, programming languages and libraries that you can use. And then also just some tools in terms of color selection and font selection. We've linked some as well at the end of our presentation. And that's just a place for you to get started with creating data visualizations to make your life easier for your audience. And our audience is our next thing. Is so know your audience in that what you wanna do is step back and think to yourself, okay, what is it that I have captured? Are there going to be any special characters um, from different languages or for statistical purposes that need to be visualized? From the very, very beginning of your data visualization, what you're going to be wanting to do is make sure that you are using the appropriate encoding so you don't lose out on those special characters. Um, are there accessibility concerns for your audience in terms of things like color blindness, um, in terms of size, needing additional, needing to put in additional alt text? Um, keeping that in mind from the very beginning of your practice is going to make your life more easy or more easy, easier. Um, and then the final one is knowing your in knowing your audience is is an online interactive tool going to be the best thing for them in that um, is it useful or would a static map or an infographic be a better solution if your user base is somewhere in a remote community and you build them some kind of crazy wordpress site with all sorts of interactive visualizations but they don't have basic internet connectivity you've wasted everybody's time and you don't want to do that you don't want to frustrate frustrate people your whole purpose is to make things easier for your audience the next thing we want to do for, your, for our audiences is to use secondary data 
sets to kind of augment and give context to your own research data. So in GIS, the idea of open data and geos open geospatial data has actually been around and widely adopted for quite a while. Um, like early 2000s, people were creating open data portals, sharing their data back and forth. So if we look at the active transport network for the city of Manitoba, We'll take a couple seconds to load. Um, so this is coming from Winnipeg's Open Data Catalog. There's they have tons and tons of different data sets. And this one is cartographic. You can go in. You can get previews of what the open transportation network looks like. Um, you can export in a variety of formats, embed in different options. And there are many different, uh, many different open data sets available. The province of Manitoba has recently launched their new open data catalog. Um, it has all sorts of open COVID data sets, health regions, stuff like that, that you can use and link into. And so the whole purpose of using those secondary data sets is to ground your own work. So people can, linking it to census data, linking it to cartographic data, so people can see what's going on, where, why, and how. In terms of our best practices, we have a couple of them to focus on. We've got color, cognitive load, and reproducibility. So if we're looking at color in terms of data classification, what we want to do is use hue, so that being like red, purple, blue, green, if we've got discrete classification. And if, we're use, if we have continuous data, then we want to use shades. So from light to dark, dark to light, to symbolize that. Humans have these things that we call unconscious perceptions. And so that's like, if you see a shape on a map that is blue, you're going to automatically think that it is water or that red is bad, green is good, um, dark means most, light means least. So knowing that those are things going on with, your, with humans' brains and your audiences, that will help you make better color selections down the road. The thing to think about with color selection is that if we're looking at the data visualization literature, what you'll read is that using the rainbow color ramp is to be avoided at all costs. But I disagree with that to a point because if you are part of a field where that rainbow color ramp is meaningful and there is a community of practice of users who have adopted that, don't go changing that just so you can say you're sticking more closely to the literature. What you want to do is give people what they know. Then if we're talking about color in terms of accessibility, what we want to do is make sure that we are, um, we're not only using color as our way to symbolize our data. So the top example, you can see three different maps with three different screenshots, or the same map in three different screenshots, with a filter applied to each of them to see how different types of colorblindness could affect that user perception. When I was working with the stakeholders, they had originally just wanted to use color, but there was somebody in the audience who said, wait a second, what do you mean three classes? I only see two different classes of colors. And so we added the icons in those map um, figures so that people could see the difference between a school and a medical facility and a home community. You can repeat that same thing if you are creating graphs in that if you've got a line graph going on using different shapes to represent the different nodes. In terms of cognitive load we want to in terms of best practices in cognitive load we want to reduce that cognitive load and we can do that by keeping consistency with font. So not having 50 different fonts going on, on your, with your visualization, with symbology, and with classification. So if we look at the back at our creatine example, we can see that in our legend, the data appears to be continuous. But in our graphic, we have, our data appears to be discrete and like it is marked in different classes. So what you'd want to do would be to either carry over one to the other or to keep that consistency going and make it easier for the user to understand what's going on. Then if we're looking at fonts, this bottom graphic has several different fonts going on in terms of header, subheader, and labels. 
maximum two fonts. One, if you are doing things for editorial pur purposes, that is kind of more exciting for your headers, and then a simple font for your labels and any body text will make it easier on your user. The other thing you want to make sure of is that you're not forcing correlation or causation by changing your, diff your axes, the scales, the scales on your different axes, in that on this side, one of them starts with a zero, the other one starts with a 10 to force that nice curve and that nice intersection in the middle. We don't want to do that, we want to start at zero on both sides. We don't want to make people do math in their head. Our next best practice is cognitive load in terms of clarity. So humans are awful at looking at and understanding complex information. So instead of stacking items, what you can do is break them out and create smaller multiples. And instead of using 3D graphics, you can flatten things. Same idea, cognitive load in terms of using labels. So pulling out specific, in, specific data points and labeling them using colors so that people can see what it is you're talking about will help the user. So we have this example in the Institute for Health Metrics. And the landing page for their VizHub is a lot. It takes a couple of minutes to load, it's very busy. Um, but you can see you're dumped in and they have a ton of information that you can kind of go through, you can click on things, um, and that's kind of how I feel about this. It's like, man, there's so much going on. I can click on so many things. Um, they've recently added the take a tour button, which was not there before, which is very, very helpful. What I would also like to see would be a pop-up window when you first navigate to the page so that people can understand what they're getting into and how they're expecting, um, how the creators of this data set are creating, are expecting users to interact with it. They've also got this subset of visualizations, and there's one that I really like, um, the importance of tobacco control in Mexico. So if I click on it and open things up, it's still a massive data set and takes a while to load, um, but you can see You've got a landing page. We understand what our topic is. And as we scroll down, we can see across the we can see our different measures. We've got descriptions. We can keep scrolling and the different measures. As we continue to scroll, it tells a story. We can see the date changing in the background. They've embedded all of their charts, maps, and graphs in the same flow, and they're explaining and pulling things out and giving you context in plain language. If I hover over this, maybe if I click on it, hover over it, um, it gives the description of each of the data points in plain language instead of just pulling together a bunch of attributes. Um, and I think it's just a really, a really well done solution to, instead of, that original dashboard with all of the health measures dumped into it. So you don't want to blind people with science. Our final best practice is our reproducibility. So what we want to do is make sure that you, if you create a data set that other people could potentially use it, other people being your colleagues down the road, um, you in 10 years, five years, whatever it is, so that you are saving your data in formats that can be ingested by different software instead of proprietary formats. So this would be things like, um, instead of saving something as an Excel file, it's saving it as a CSV sheet. We also want it to be easy for, or maybe you don't want it to be easy, maybe you want your job security. But ideally, what you would do is create solutions with robust documentation so that other people, if you got hit by a bus, somebody else could pick up your work and continue on with what you were doing. Um, this also leads into the idea behind open science and making research more open and discoverable um, for others. 
So you want to do that. In terms of tools, we touched on that already in the visualization guide. You want to be kind to yourself. So if you only have a couple of days to create a graphic, don't be going and learning a new tool. Just make good decisions using PowerPoint or Excel or a tool that you're already comfortable with um, and use that. So don't feel pressured into using more complex tools. It's, um, it's, the, it's the content that's important. The other suggestion that I make for people is tell them to find examples. So if they find an example of something that they want to emulate in their own work, um, then that will help you. It kind of helps you kind of get inspiration for down the road. So in this example, you've got the first graph that um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, but this person kind of encountered something from, from Nafix book, Storytelling with Data. I'm looking at it because it's above my head. And what they've done is they've gone in and redone their own, redone their own graphic in that same style. And if you ever want help in figuring out how to make these decisions, always ask for it. I'm here. My email is attached to all of this at the end of the presentation as well. And now Hal is going to talk to you a bit about PowerPoint presentations. Yeah, thanks, Meg. That was great. Um, so what I'm talking about here is, is about PowerPoints and how we have the tendency to um, rely on some of the features and the way that they are set up uh, in their default mode. And that may not necessarily be the best way to use PowerPoint when you're making your presentations. So let's go to the next slide. So I just want to um, be forthcoming about this. This is all based on a TEDx uh, presentation that I watched by David Phillips. He's a storyteller. And it's um, provide a link to this uh, TEDx talk, it's about 20 minutes long and it's at the end of this, and it's how to avoid death by PowerPoint. And I found it um, really helpful. And I started to use some of his uh, suggestions uh, and examples uh, that he does in this and found that it actually made my, uh, when I have to give a PowerPoint presentation and, and give a talk associated with it, it's a lot easier. And I'll explain that as we go through. So it looks like, yeah, we're going to have a poll coming up. So I'm going to, uh, our Meg's going to put up a slide and I think Christine should be launching a poll, which is, do you like the background for this slide? Select one. Okay, let's so, see what we get. About half of the people have voted. Did you want to wait a couple more That's seconds? That's fine. Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Now. I'm I'm going to shut it down for you here. All right. <laughs> uh, did you want to know what the result was, by the way? Yeah. I'm just not seeing our presentation right at the moment. So it, it was half and half. Half oh, said yes and half said no uh, out of the people oh. who voted. Not Excellent. everyone voted, but you know. Okay, so I want you to keep that picture of that background in mind. So how does that background work? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. So as a slide title, it's actually not bad. It's got a nice color. It's got something going on there. Um, I find the colors pleasing. But this actually came from a presentation. And, and what we're seeing here is, is that the information is lost. There's just, it's too distracting. There's too much going on. So uh, we got one more quick little poll here. How about this slide? Is it better than the previous slide? So keep that in mind and let's see what people vote on this one.
Okay, so we've got, it looks like everyone who wants to vote has voted, um, and this time 63% say yes and 38% say no. Okay, so let's go back to that. Let's take a look. So there are some things I do like about this. You know, it's a little bit cleaner. There's not a lot of distracting uh, information going on or visuals going on, but there are also some issues with this, okay? Um, what we're having is, is yeah, there's some parts of this slide are being emphasized more than other. And actually there's too much information going on in here. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So once again, like I said, if, if you sort of, this has piqued your interest a little bit, go and take a look at this uh, TED Talk Power presentation. Uh, so next slide. And so I'm going to give you what I'm calling the Coles Notes or the Sparks Notes version of it. I have to give both of those now because when I first started uh, doing presentations for the college rehabilitation uh, students, um, I always was referring to Coles Notes and they all looked like me, like I, what the is that? I have no idea. Apparently now it's called Sparks Notes. So there we go. So I'm dating myself and I'm dating you. So um, think about that last slide. So the important thing is, is that you want to have one message per slide. You're probably noticing that going on as this presentation is uh, that we're doing ourselves. This is the way we have set things up. So next slide. Contrast. Contrast is really important. Meg was talking about this and when it comes to the actual uh, um, uh, uh, presentation of data as well as, as the slides itself. And what you can start to see is, is that we also have contrast here on our slides in that I'm emphasizing parts of the, this presentation and de-emphasizing other parts of the presentation. Um, content, contrast can also go to um, the title uh, of each slide. So uh, PowerPoint defaults to this nice large banner across the top, and that's immediately what your eye is drawn to. But that's not what you're trying to get across to the audience. You're trying to get across to them the points. So what I started to do is, is to de-emphasize some of those other um, uh, areas of the slide and emphasize the things that I'm talking to. The next thing that I have been doing and has really helped my presentations and made me feel more comfortable as I'm doing the presentation is avoiding sentences, uh, putting up the full uh, idea or the full point on the on the slide. It's um, we've all been in presentations where the person presenting ends up just reading their slides because all of the information is up there. And that's uh, distracting in a couple of different ways because you're uh, taking your uh, concentration away from the presenter and putting it on the slide and they're trying to see if they can read the points before you're finished, they're trying to get it all in and then their mind starts to wander. So avoiding sentences is, good for the presenter, but it's also good uh, for the person watching because they only have to concentrate on the, uh, the basic uh, point that you're trying to get across. All right, backgrounds, same sort of thing. Um, it depends on the environment you're in, and we're gonna take a look at that in a second, but uh, the background makes a big difference. And then the one thing that uh, uh, Phillips talks about in is this that you should have only six objects on your slide at any one time. That's about cognitively what people can handle. So if I'm thinking about that or a slide where a uh, little bit better version of that slide, there were eight points on there, that's too much. It's too distracting. Okay. So uh, we're going to do in a little example of a before and after here. So let's take a look. So we have a couple. So this is actually based on a presentation that I used to do, selecting a journal. It was a publications, uh, preparing for your first publication. And so here's how it originally, uh, I was originally doing my PowerPoint. So you can see there's that banner that says wide readership in your field and your eyes are just drawn up to there. And I have more of these sentence type uh, structures in here. I only have three points, which is good, but it's, again, uh, people, if they're 
looking at this, they're reading the whole thing. Maybe they're not paying so much attention to what I'm saying. So next slide. And in exercise, you know, so often uh, us librarians love to go off and do demonstrations or get people to do things. So this is what I had in my slide presentation. So we'd uh, uh, find, uh, ask people to find something regarding their journal. So here, uh, yeah, next one is um, the way that I'm starting to do this. I love using the uh, little section titles in the PowerPoints because it tells my audience what we're coming up to. So selecting a journal is what this is all about. Next slide. And you can see at the top, I put a little select your journal. It's faded out, but it, as you, the person that's looking at this presentation, you know that it's related to this section. So rather than that long sentence, I've broken it up. Journals you read, and again, uh, emphasizing and de-emphasizing as we go. So this is the new way that I've started to do my presentations. Background color can make a big difference and back, dark uh, backgrounds work too. And why would I ever use this? Uh, if I knew a little bit more about the room that I'm presenting in, and I know I'm going to be presenting in a dark uh, unlit room, some classroom with no windows, uh, I will use, if I know that uh, information ahead of time, and I will use that and put in a dark background with a, uh, a contrast, uh, high contrasting uh, font color um, in the slide, because this is actually easier to read. It's easier on your eyes than if I had this with a white background in a dark room and it's just uh, glaring light. So there is uh, the opportunity to um, use that as well, uh, the, the dark background. So Meg and I are asking you to try and remember now our little research story. We're gonna go through this and we're going to show you how we have taken that research story and Meg's changed some of the graphics and I've changed some of the uh, slide setups. And we're gonna retell our research story now. And before we go on, I wanted to show you that, um, that you can use the slide decks by your institution as well, and still uh, use uh, some of the techniques that I talked about or that Phillips talks about in his presentation. Um, yeah, there are, I realize that we have constraints as we go uh, and do our presentations on behalf of our institutions, but uh, you can still implement some of those things in your, uh, some of those techniques that uh, I was talking about in this presentation. So let's go ahead with this, Meg. Okay, so the project. Excellent. Uh, keep it simple. We had that long paragraph before. So woodland creatures like recreation too, right? And our study participants. And uh, we talk about inclusion criteria. And here's that whole idea of uh, emphasizing, and I would be flipping through this, I would say, oh, skunks next, you know, our feral cats are in excluded. And the next one, domestic dogs and cats were also excluded from our study. And our next so section, get... that's... sorry? So then if we get into our creature populations, what I've done is broken things out. So our previous graphic was this woodland creature populations pie chart, it's 3D. We've got conflict between our slide title and our graphic title. We have, we're using, here we're not using hue, we're using shades when things are actually discrete units. Um, and our labels are getting grayed out We've also got duplication between labels on the graph and a legend. So what I've done is instead we're using hue to symbolize each of those um, each of those population elements. We have one simple title. It's our study population. We're echoing color on our graphic to the labels to keep consistency because we have labels uh, where you're not using a legend. And to keep things a little bit interesting, because somebody put you wanted to, you want to make it a little bit interesting. 
what you can do is instead of making something 3D, is put a very small drop shadow on it. It creates that visual interest while keeping things simple for your reader or your audience to understand. So you can see that difference. If we're looking at our recreational activities, how? Yeah, so it is fine to use images in your presentation and you can don't go overboard on it because then the impact of the Im uh, images uh is lost if you're just going image after image after image and especially if it's not really uh helping you tell your story so here's the recreational studies that meg and i studied so much of our very <laughs> creatures that we were looking at in our uh in our study Then if we were looking at popular recreational locations, um, as soon as I see the word location, I think map. Um, and because maps help people ground, help ground people in geography. So initially we had this table, we had quadrants, park names, addresses, popularity. And what I would probably do would be to go to an open data site, download the parks data, um, I don't want all of it because as we were talking about before, human brains are only good at seeing, at understanding um, smaller numbers of elements. So having every single park on our map might not be the most reasonable thing to do, but having the parks with who had the highest popularity, um, we can do that and we can subset them out and put them on a map. If you wanted to include the table as well, that would be great. Um, but it's not necessary. Just have a good title and use your maps. Then if we're looking at our activity levels by month, this was our initial graphic. So once again, we've got inconsistency between our titles, park use by month and activity level by month. Um, you really want to make things as simple as possible for the user and having these ambiguous labels, the background, that's competing with your graphic and all of your stacked lines doesn't make life very easy. So there's two ways that you can go about dealing with these stacked graphics. Um, the first one is, and it's, well, it's using smaller multiples and you can do that in two ways. So you don't want to pull out every single data point. What you're doing is saying, okay, I think skunks are important here and you're just showing skunks or you're just showing those key courses, those, those key elements. And so you've got your key graph. A lot of people are familiar with EMAP, but you've got a key graph up in the top right corner or top left corner. And then you are using a broader, the main graphic to show just the line for skunks. And we've just pulled out skunks in our legend. The other thing you can do is if you've got two things that you want to compare and having those other lines in the background is useful, then graying out those other lines and letting them fall into those other data points and letting them fall into the background um, along with our grid lines for the graphic and then just pulling out our red squirrels and our gray squirrels to demonstrate there was something going on with the gray squirrels in August. Um, that's something that you can do as well. And it just makes it easier for you to get your story across for your audience. So yeah, and then here was a little explanation of squirrels and what type of hibernators they are. And again, using these bullet points and fading in and out and uh, using different font sizes um, and colors can really help you then talk about each of these things and it would be much easier for you uh, as a presenter to uh, expand on these ideas when it's nice and concise, but then also the audience that you're talking to, they're remembering the big bullet points on there and they're going to take in the information a lot better. And our little reference session so at the end. So yeah, so the main points of our presentation. Highlight your findings, don't hide. Oh, I think that was yours, Meg. <laughs> you can take mine now. <laughs> but really, they all, they work for both of us. 
Yeah. So yeah, it's back. It doesn't matter if you're making a PowerPoint. It doesn't matter if you're making graphics. Um, this is our whole point of our presentation is that you're the most important part of your presentation, not your slides, and don't blind people with science. You're wanting to make things as clear and as simple and guide your audience through whatever it is you're trying to touch whatever it is you're trying to tell be it a research project be it an annual report you don't need to just dump everything on your audience and say hey look i did so much stuff look at all these crazy graphics i have 150 slides in my slide deck it's all in 10 point font like that's awful nobody wants to see any of that um and you probably didn't have a very fun time making that presentation so figuring out um, distilling your message and then using visualize a combination of visualization and words to present your points it's going to make life easier and lovelier for everyone yeah i was going to add that you don't have to really worry about how many slides you have this presentation was what 40 minutes we've been into it a little less and it's 119 slides long so it's not about the number of slides, it's about how you put the information on those slides. So that's the important thing to remember. So we got some time for some questions. I don't know if we can get audio questions, but I'm monitoring the uh, question chat box. And at the end, we also you're gonna get the slide deck after the presentation, but not the entire slide deck, just a distilled version of it. And there are links to nativeland.ca's if you want to explore that, uh, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, my data visualization guide, the links to where my examples came from, and then Hal's links from all of his PowerPoint, his PowerPoint videos, some tutorials, and complimentary font and color generators. Yeah, so uh, on that uh, PowerPoint template, uh link um i found it really helpful as i learned how to create the slide decks that i created my own template um so the learning curve is a little steep to begin with and the time it takes a little bit of time at the beginning but now i have it down that it really doesn't take me any more time to create a powerpoint presentation like this as compared to the way that i was doing it before and that's another thing that I will add is you're not constrained to PowerPoint. You're constrained to whatever slide deck, um, whatever slide software you're using. I use Reveal to, like I code my slides um, with JavaScript and HTML, and I can use the same techniques there. So it doesn't, once again, same thing as I was saying for my visualization tools, uh, it doesn't matter what tool you select, it's the decisions you're making within the tool. Um, we have a question in the chat box, which I'll, I'll read it out so everybody can uh, see or hear. Uh, so this person makes a lot of dashboard charts for monitoring over time. How do you recommend data viz showing data against a target over time? They've just been using line graphs with one line being the target. So line graphs with one line being a target. That's not. It isn't a bad. That's not a bad way to do to do things because people understand. That's something that people understand. You've got a benchmark. You're trying to hit your benchmark. Um, having and having that having that target be present in your in your graphic, I think, is really important. Um, not maybe not making it super dominant in what you're doing. But there are different there are different things you can do instead of just using a line graph. Like you could use a Gantt chart. You could put it into a timeline instead. There are plenty of timeline tools out there. Um, and then instead of just having your instead of having a line graph, um, it's a little bit more interesting for people to navigate through different time. And the thing with timeline tools is there's many different ones out there. And what you can do is say you're using SharePoint or something like that, you can link different elements into your into your timeline so that if somebody was looking for a specific, like if you were doing a workflow for a specific project to see different steps along the way, that people can use that timeline as the basis and then link out to these different things within. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, we'll give them. Oh, they say sure. Uh, as we sort of invite others to um, include their questions or or their thoughts or comments, um, I think or I know I've certainly grabbed some great little snippets um, to you know take forward into future presentations. And I loved your emphasis about you know, use the things that you already know, or if you have a little bit of time, um, don't try to jump in and learn all kinds of other things. Like we can uh, use very effectively the tools that are at disposal. I think that that's really, really great and important. Another question has just to say, what transition did you use in the PowerPoints? I didn't use any of the transitions at all. I just created, so, one um, here. Yeah, I can open up the PowerPoint and you can see yeah. what's going on. So yep. we go through. It's one slide. So the way I create that that particular slide is this: I just write out all three points, copy it three times, and start to you know, change fonts and colors on it. It's um, sometimes the transitions that happen in PowerPoints, they slow up, you're not in complete control of them all the time. I find this much easier to, to work with. And like I said, it really doesn't take much time because I've also created my own template. So all my colors and fonts are, are all preset. So like I said, a little bit at the beginning, but you don't have to do all of these steps at once. You can just start with one or two little things. Like I'm not going to go more than six points on my, you know, on, on whatever I put on a particular uh, slide. Um, you know, I might try and emphasize some things with some uh, bolding or different color contrast. Yeah, it can be yeah, pretty straightforward. Just... Yeah. Or just doing things like having, okay, having content blocks that all of your content is going to have an orange header, examples are going to have a green, and examples are going to have a green, and for us, I think we had polls are blue. Just these little, using color, using font weight, using whatever you want to kind of set people up for just this expectation of, oh, we're on a green slide. This means it's going to be something interactive or we're on a blue slide. That means a poll is coming up. Um, and just kind of thinking about ways to cue your user um, or your audience so they don't feel overwhelmed and they just, they feel like they feel comfortable with you already. And it's nice to have a change also happen in your slide presentation as well, because it gives you a chance to say, oh, I'm onto something new, you know, uh, oh, this looks interesting, and you suddenly grab their attention again. Lovely. Um, I'm taken to, sometimes I've been at presentations and I've been really wowed by the presentation, like it's had been very impactful or the speaker has really been dynamic. And, um, and then sometimes I've went and sat down and thought, and I have reflected about like, oh, that was such a great presentation. I will try to do it like that. But um, sometimes it is, you know, there's, there's a lot of style element, right? Um, that comes that comes into that. So, uh, like I think about your use of color, or you know those different boldings, and how you know it's it's also about drilling down about what made that impactful, or what made me remember that so vividly, or those kinds of things, and then doing that reflection. Right? It's not necessarily doesn't always come down. It comes down to like was it clear, and were they concise about what they were doing, or um, or was the topic interesting and less about how many flashy wingdings did they include? Yeah, I yeah. think it comes down to what Meg said too, and we've said at the end, it's not about your slide deck or your data so much. It's about you as well. You're the one presenting it. So uh, they should be focusing on you. Your the PowerPoint and the data data is there to, to tell the story as well, but it's, you know, you're the one that 
has to present it. So. And that's a big part of it too, though, is being kind to your future self. So thinking to yourself, okay, I've got X number of days till I have to present. Um, what's gonna, what is going to make you feel better? Are you, is like pounding away at a PowerPoint until 10 minutes before your session? Um, is that going to make you comfortable? Or is adopting small changes to something that you, you've already created um, and that you're already comfortable with and doing things gradually going to be the better solution for you? The whole the, that's the other kind of like subtext to our presentation is it's all about you and so you in terms of the creation as well you don't want to be stressed out and you want to feel like you have ownership over what it is you have done and if it feels like your powerpoint or your presentation is driving you with all of these things that you just adopted and this and you're being this person that maybe you're not completely comfortable with being with some i don't know crazy flashy tool um, that's not going to benefit anybody. So just being honest with yourself and saying, hey, I'm going to try this thing today, or I feel comfortable trying this new tool, or I've got time to do this thing. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be good for everyone, audience and you. Both bits are important. Oh, love that. So we are a little over our scheduled time, which is okay. So maybe we'll just do that last call for questions. And uh, just as those, in case there's any uh, final ones that are coming in, we want to thank everyone for attending um, today and to stay tuned for our next MyNet Education session coming up next month. It's about preprints. I'm very excited about this one. <laughs> like the theme, the theme of the day is Orvi feels excited about uh, about learning new things. Um, and we just want to sincerely thank Hal and Meg for this really thoughtful presentation um, that gives, I hope everybody has, everybody else has taken away as many um, uh, helpful tools that I know I'm going to incorporate into my future presentation. So I hope that that's been um, everyone's experience. Any, any concluding thoughts from you, Christine? Um, no, no, nothing you haven't really hit already. It's just, you know, thanks also again for me. Um, some really good tips in there. I think uh, I think we need to go redesign the the, the preprints session. So uh, something for my to do list. We'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's a lot of a lot of good stuff that you guys covered. Um, and like you said, you don't have to do everything, but just kind of pick and choose. And it's all, a, a, any improvement is an improvement. And be kind to yourself. I like that. And to your future self. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.